Conversely, I have people who I know are struggling more who will do their utmost to afford whatever their pet needs, regardless of the impact on their own well-being. Welcome to the Call the Vet Show, the podcast that helps pet parents understand and optimize the health of their furry family so they can live the full and happy life you want for them. And here's your host, veterinarian, Dr. Alex Avery. Hello, kia ora. Welcome to another episode of the show. Delighted to be talking to you again this week. And this week is really more of a, a thought piece. I want to kind of explore a few ideas with you and, you know, we might disagree. We may be on the same page, but we've been speaking a lot Recently, uh, a few episodes ago, we spoke about the human-animal bond. We've also spoken about the the bond with our stray and feral cats. And so I want to explore the idea or the thought, should you keep a pet if you can't afford their care? I'm sure this is something that you've come across, maybe even thought about, maybe even commented on over on Facebook or some other social media platform or in the comment sections of you know, different kind of media reports and that kind of things where often uh, emotions can run pretty high and there is a, very much a polarizing of opinions. And so I want to kind of explore the thought behind this idea and whether it's a justified opinion to have or whether actually it's maybe a little bit more complicated than we may at first uh, kind of think it is. But before we get into that, uh, if you've not listened before, then I'm veterinarian Dr. Alex. I'm a vet in general practice down in beautiful Aotearoa, New Zealand, originally from the UK. And this is the podcast. If you want to learn more about your pet's care, if you want to think a little bit more deeply than maybe some of the superficial blogs uh, and social posts that you come across, um, and really if you want the best for your pet. So if that sounds like you, then make sure you hit that subscribe or follow button if you are not already a subscriber. And if you've listened before, then I'm delighted that you've taken the time to join me for yet another episode. And as always, I'd love to hear your thoughts, comments. You can hit me up over on YouTube. Comments is probably actually the best place. I kind of go backwards and forwards over the social media platforms. I'm not a big user or fan of social media personally. Um, maybe a little bit of a dinosaur from that point of view. Um, but Facebook, uh, Facebook, Facebook, but YouTube comments is is something that I always try and at least read and uh, most likely to reply. So I'd love to hear your comments. Um, you can find me on YouTube. It's Our Pets Health. I am also on Instagram, Facebook, um, even the odd TikTok video now uh, where you can find me at Our Pets Health on all of those platforms. And so with all that introduction out of the way, let's jump in to the episode proper. And now on with the show. So at the vet clinic, you can imagine we see all manner of different cases that need a really wide range of different investigative options um, or treatment pathways that we need to decide upon. And they vary hugely in the cost that can come with them, the price tag that can come with them. We also see clients from all walks of life, or certainly I do in, in my clinic, from very wealthy to those that are struggling to actually properly feed and clothe themselves. Uh and so sometimes the most expensive treatments are affordable and sometimes those even on the cheaper end of the spectrum are out of reach. And, you know, I'm very well aware and I'm sure you're aware and you maybe be a part of this, but this scenario plays out in vet clinics across the world. And as well as getting retold in staff rooms, uh, as I mentioned at the beginning, it also gets retold on social media forums, um, in media articles, often which are vilifying the veterinary profession, unfortunately, um, or in uh, spaces where the owner is simply seeking help and advice. And one common retort that I read uh, time and again is that along the lines of if you can't afford their care then you shouldn't have a pet but is that really right and that's really the sentiment and the discussion that I want to have with you and explore with you today. Now, as always, I don't claim to have all the answers. Uh, this is very much my op opinion, my feelings around this. And it's feelings and opinions that do change and morph and develop and evolve over time as well. You know, but I've been doing this job for 16, 17 or something like that years now. So, uh, you know, it's something that I have come across time and again, and I've had plenty of time to 
see the stories that go on kind of behind the scenes that aren't maybe uh, at, at first apparent. But really, on the face of things, there's nothing wrong with the sentiment of if you can't afford their care, you shouldn't have a pet. You know, it's coming from a place of care, from a place of love for that animal, of recognising the individual needs of an individual dog or cat and actually wanting every pet to have every health option available to them. And in an ideal world, this would absolutely be the case. Finances would play no role in healthcare decision making, but we don't live in that ideal world we live in in the real world and this isn't even the case when it comes to our own care and i'm going to touch on that later and and this is exactly where this sentiment or this belief this statement starts to break down so to to highlight this i want to give you a a scenario so let's take uh, the hypothetical jones family they include mum heather um, she works as a developer we've got dad john who's a part-time gardener two primary age kids Stefan James and a five-year-old Hamish a much loved border terrier now I say border terrier because they're the breed that's got a soft spot in my heart and if I had a dog I don't I've currently got two cats and a guinea pig but if I had a dog I think it would be a border terrier grew up with spaniels and I do love spaniels but um yeah I think um a border terrier would be what I would go for but anyway there's clearly nothing wrong here they live within their means Heather She's got a you know high paying job. They can afford the top level of health insurance for the whole family, for for themselves, but also for Hamish. And they do have a rainy day fund as well, just in case the um, care that Hamish needs actually uh, exceeds the uh, the payout for that health insurance. But what then if Heather? Um, suddenly gets laid off unexpectedly and while they have some savings to cushion the blow it won't be long before they will be struggling to pay their rent or pay their mortgage you know especially the costs of those are climbing and this may be a familiar situation to you right now um and if she can't find a new job they're really going to be in trouble so they tighten their belts they cut out all costs that aren't an absolute necessity Hamish's insurance premium then gets downgraded to accident only and they would struggle to pay any uncovered costs of more than about about five thousand dollars is this still okay for them to keep Hamish in their lives now what then if times you know get really tough for them you know jobs are hard to come by no matter the industry Heather she just really can't find a new job and dad john only manages to pick up a few extra hours of gardening here and there and has a look around for other jobs but there's just nothing going so the family they have to move to a cheaper rental that is still barely affordable Um, and really if it's not needed for day-to-day living then whatever that is is now simply unaffordable they've worked their way through their savings they are trying to keep their kids lives consistent provide everything that their kids need um, to maintain kind of their their well-being Hamish's insurance is long gone and the family could just about scrape together a few hundred bucks if needed for an emergency should they still keep Hamish in their lives you know that is a real question because that is the reality of many people or the potential reality you know even for people who have um, you know plenty of income it may be that actually they don't have very much disposable income but you, you know it says we're only two or three paychecks away from being in real desperate need so this could be the reality that any of us face depending on what life throws our way and I imagine kind of listening to that you probably don't see an issue here with the family keeping Hamish as part of their family um, they're changing financial status it's got nothing to do with changing how much they love him how much they try and care for him and try and do the best that they can for him and you know thinking about that human animal bond which is what we discussed um, with Dr Doug Mader in episode 140 definitely one to check out if you've not listened to that already you know it's clear not only the benefit that Hamish can bring to the whole family in terms of well-being mental well-being but also their you know their health um you know we also need to think about the distress that will be caused by having to give him up for adoption to taking him to a shelter to basically giving up a member of your family how distressing is that going to be for mum and dad but also for uh, for the two kids in this situation so that's one one scenario kind of talking through a couple of uh you know potential situations that 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 may well happen and the current time that we're living in you know this is going to unfortunately be the reality for many people out there um but what if the situation is changed slightly we'll change the scenario to maybe make it a little bit in inverted commas easier for you um 
if we start out with the fact that mum has poor health and she's unable to work, um, dad's working at low income jobs, there's no security there uh you know he's constantly at risk of being made redundant or being laid off i mean maybe even on a zero hours contract so it doesn't know whether he's going to you know work from one day to the next and as a family they have no ability to save for a rainy day they are struggling to make ends meet they are providing the best they can for their family um you know they can afford hamish's basic routine healthcare needs but if anything serious happened they would they would really struggle and, and realistically they'd be unable to to cope with paying for a bill of any significance so should they have even brought hamish into their family in the first place should they forego the benefits to their own health and well-being to that of their children Uh, and also from hamish's point of view you know we're living in a time when there are loads of dogs and cats up for adoption um, living in shelters that need a good home so should help should hamish have missed out on being part of a family that love him and love him very much and do their very best they can for him i'm going to leave that that question hanging there but if we go back to that initial statement you know if you can't afford their care you shouldn't have a pet what should we consider the minimum someone should be able to afford what should we what what do we consider their care in inverted commas well is that just the initial set of you know vaccines and spay neuter costs uh, are we talking about a couple of consultations and a short course of treatment what about a more involved investigation and hospital stay so maybe some blood some x-ray ultrasound and staying in the hospital for a couple of days for a more serious illness Should we be able to afford regular dental procedures for some breeds that might ideally be every six to 12 months? What about surgical repair of a fractured leg, which is going to be many, many thousands of dollars? And then what about MRI and spinal surgery for a slip disc or um, investigation for, um, you know, seizures and potential for brain surgery if there is a growth to be found? You know, that's going to be tens potentially of thousands of dollars. Is that the level of care that we need to be able to Uh, uh, be able to afford if we're making that statement you know we also need to add in the fact that the vast majority of pets they're never going to need expensive surgery they're never going to develop a severe illness and so that line becomes even harder to draw if we're making these blanket statements and we also need to bear in mind that all too often unfortunately people ourselves we're struggling to pay or to access care for our own health care needs you know i read about the cost of insulin um in in the us which is just ridiculously expensive and is unforgivable and when um you know i don't like to knock um whole industries but when we talk about big pharma that is you know one of the poster charts there's no justification for being that expensive but that's the reality that people are living in um diabetic people are struggling to afford the care that is keeping them alive or you know a different scenario dental care access to to dental care even when costs are subsidized as in the uk can be um, almost impossible um you know so is it fair to demand that we can only have a pet we can only have an animal in our life if we can provide them with better care than we can provide for ourselves now clearly you know this human health situation it's also unacceptable but it is the reality that we live in and vilifying doctors vilifying um, veterinarians and people working in the veterinary industry uh, is is you know false as well and I've spoken about that and I'm not going to go on a big rant about that but the bottom line is is where do we draw the line with affordability and then the next thought comes that I would also say that experience tells me that just because someone can afford care doesn't always mean that actually when push comes to shove, they will choose to spend their money on their pet at their pet's time of need. You know, I often come across people who have the funds available or at least you know they appear to be well off and i know that um, appearances can be deceptive and it may be that they've you know dressing really well they've got the most expensive uh, uh smartphone they're driving a very nice car but maybe their eyeballs in debt you know i'm aware that that can be the case but you know i i will often come across people who you know appear to have plenty of funds available but who decline even simple diagnostics or treatment courses for their pet even when the the prognosis is likely very very good conversely i have people who i know are struggling more who will do their utmost to afford whatever their pet needs regardless of the impact on their own well-being 
you know, money in the bank, it really doesn't always mean that it will go to the family's pet care at the time their dog or cat needs that money to be spent. And so what are my thoughts? Should you keep a pet if you can't afford their care? What level of care should you be able to afford before bringing a pet into your life? Well, you know, these are these are my opinions. I, I feel that ideally everyone should be able to meet the minimum preventive health care requirements of vaccination, of parasite control, and what that means depends on geography and where you live in the world, as well as de-sexing. You know, these are known costs. There are cheaper options often available through maybe charity schemes, through low-cost clinics, um, through access of different uh, different funds that might be available, again, depending on where you live. But all of these things make this level of care even more accessible. And these are known costs. These are costs that can be planned for. They can also be spread out over a period of time. You know, we don't uh, get a puppy, vaccinate them and neuter them all in the same week. It's something that's spread out over, you know, months, even a couple of years. Clearly, people also absolutely need to be able to properly feed their pet that can be a potential issue for our bigger dogs, especially. They do actually need to eat quite a lot. And even the, you know, the cheapest food can add up to a significant expense. We also need to be able to provide them with safe and healthy environment for, for them to, to live in. And we also need to care for them. We need to be emotionally invested. We need to, to love them. They're not just a commodity to be owned, a status symbol. They are a living animal and sometimes unfortunately that's where even people with the most money um you know fall down and and fail to recognize i also think that ideally there should be a rainy day fund to allow for treatment uh for basic treatment so a trip to the veterinarian for a consultation and a basic course of maybe anti-inflammatories and antibiotics you know that will again vary but let's say that's somewhere between two to five hundred dollars now is this an absolute essential an absolute necessity uh no i don't believe so but I think it's something that every pet parent can aspire to and work towards and there also are alternative options uh, various credit options you know these unfortunately often tend to come at a high cost to access in terms of setup fees and interest charges um, but they are options that are available and I believe that at the very least everyone should have some kind of plan or awareness of these options should the worst happen and I've spoken before about uh, the different options available if you know we're really struggling to meet costs um, I'll leave links to those in the show notes as well now if you're buying a dog from a breeder if you're going out of your way to to buy a purebred dog um, of a specific breed that would actually set the bar higher because those dogs are you know costing many thousands of dollars in most cases currently um, and i would say that actually if you can afford to to go to a breeder to spend that kind of money on a dog then really you should have a should have a treatment fund of at least twice the purchase cost um, as a as a guideline though if you're getting a breed that is known to frequently suffer from expensive problems and and the breed that springs immediately to my mind is the bulldog um, a breed that I am seeing more of in the clinic at the moment, um, then you know either insurance and full insurance is a must or your emergency fund really needs to be higher because the chance of your pet needing it is much, much greater. So those are my uh, thoughts around this topic and my belief about what we should be able to afford to have a pet in our life. But I want to leave you with this final thought or idea that you know while having a pet in our life it is a privilege and not a right do we really want to make them a luxury item that only the very wealthy can afford do we really want to deny so many people the joy and benefits of having a furry family member in our life the the huge benefits to our well-being and to our physical health that they bring and do we want to deny these animals the opportunity of living in homes where they will be truly loved well to my mind the answer to all of these is no. Helping your pet live the happy, healthy life they deserve. So I hope that gave you some food for, for thought um, and maybe made you aware of some situations of the reality of different people at different walks of life. And I'd love to hear your thoughts on this as well, um, you know, on all of those platforms that um, I mentioned beginning. Also, if you're not um, actually signed up to my newsletter, The Pet Post, it goes out um, maybe once or twice a month, typically um, a week or so after these podcast episodes. There's the odd extra one thrown in where I talk a little bit about kind of 
what's going on in in the podcast so it gets gives you an idea of what you may have missed out on if you don't catch an episode um, but it also runs through a couple of other related posts links to some other pieces of content on a, a similar vein as well as giving some updates in the healthcare world so some news about maybe new treatments new studies out there new developments that really it would be very valuable for you to know about um, you can head over to ourpetshealth.com and the home page there there's a link to sign up to the pet so I'd love to have you along uh, as a, 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 a pet post recipient. Um, there's about two and a half thousand pet parents on there at the moment and growing. So I'd love for you to be a part of that. And you can always just hit that reply to any email I send. And I read those personally and try and respond to them in as timely a fashion as possible as well. So I'd love to hear your thoughts. Finally, if you think this will benefit anyone in your life, any other pet parent pet lover out there then i'd love for you to um, let them know that this is a podcast that they would benefit from listening to so forwarding it to them or sharing it on your social platforms just to help me spread the word and ultimately help to impact and improve the life of more pet parents and more pets out there but for now that's it from me for this episode of the show I'm looking forward to talking to you in the next one. But until then, I'm veterinarian Dr. Alex. This is the Call the Vet Show because they're family. That's it for this episode of the Call the Vet Show. Be sure to visit callthevet.org to join the conversation, access the show notes, and discover our fantastic bonus content. We'll see you next time.